now at 11. That was a pretty damn interesting landing. They were on board the plane that crashed in Clark County and lived to laugh about it. <laughs> Alive it again. When you just close your eyes and you think of your poor wife who's going to have to do the taxes uh, because you're not there. Plus, moving up the vaccine schedule. All adults in Washington will be eligible in just two weeks. The more that we can get vaccine, the more the life can get back to normal. And Portland scraps a plan that would have allowed organized homeless camps in some parks around the city. We begin with breaking news of a crash that has all northbound lanes of I-5 closed right now, about six miles south of Woodburn. We just got these pictures in from the scene. You can see here one vehicle in flames. We don't know yet how many people have been hurt, but investigators do expect this to be a long closure. Now to that incredible story of survival. Two friends walked away from a plane crash in rural Clark County with only minor injuries. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Laurel Porter. We first told you about this downed plane Monday night. It sparked an hours long search. Tonight, our Mike Benner caught up with one of the men on board. That was a that was a pretty damn interesting landing, Truman. You did a nice job. Never yeah. before seen video shows the moments right after a Piper Cherokee 140 crashed in the hills outside of Yakult, Washington. Right, here I am, <laughs> alive it again. <laughs> Little scratch on my forehead, a few scratches on my leg. Truman got a little more, got a couple black eyes. That's it. Craig Bellis was the passenger and co-pilot alongside his pal Truman O'Brien for the flight from Central Oregon to Vashon Island Monday afternoon. Craig says shortly after crossing over the Columbia River into Washington, at an altitude of 8,000 feet, the engine on the four-seat aircraft started to cough and the plane started descending. You are now flying uh, totally in the clouds. You, can, you can't really see past the, the windshield. Um, you can't see anything. You can't see the river, you can't see the, the woods, you can't see the mountains, nothing. Craig says the plane eventually emerged from the clouds. Air traffic control let Craig and Truman know about a small airport eight miles away, but the men knew they wouldn't make it. They immediately started searching for a place to touch down. Logging roads are too dangerous and the uh, the clearings aren't really clearings they have big old growth stumps in them the men's best chance at survival would be the tops of the trees in the gifford pinchot national forest so you come in on top of the trees at an angle you're ripping off the tops of the trees you're slowing down really fast then craig says the plane dropped through the trees nose first it's just everything is just crashing and banging and you know you're in every different position you're being thrown around and then finally, after you drop, you're saying to yourself, kind of, am I done? Are we done? Did we make it to the ground without a tree coming through the windshield or, or the whole cabin collapsing or whatever the case may be? The men were alive, but not out of danger. They freed themselves from the mangled aircraft as quickly as possible because fuel was pouring out of the tank. We really weren't concerned about ourselves. We were concerned about our family because they expected us back on Vashon around four or 4.30. And they, they had to get the call from the, from the local police up there saying your husband's plane has gone down. <sighs> Craig and Truman would spend hours in the woods before search crews found them and hoisted them to safety, bringing to an end a harrowing ordeal. The most heartening thing about this whole experience is the overwhelming support and love that uh, Truman and I have gotten from our friends on Bashan Island uh, and around the, around the United States and around the world. In addition to that, Craig Bellis wants to express his gratitude to all of the first responders in Southwest Washington. They are partly responsible for him feeling as good as he does. In fact, Craig feels so good, he spent Wednesday volunteering at a vaccine clinic near his home. Our very best to Craig and Truman O'Brien. I'm Mike Benner for KGW News. Wow, harrowing is right. We're glad they're okay. In a developing story tonight, we're working to learn what led up to a person being hit and killed by a MAX train this, this evening. It happened about 6 o'clock near the Southeast Clinton and 12th Avenue station. That's on the Orange Line. MAX service was delayed for about two hours during the investigation. New tonight, another local man has been accused of taking part in the breach at the U.S. Capitol. Mark Brew was arrested in Vancouver yesterday. According to an affidavit, the FBI tied him to the Capitol riot through a tip, then found photos and video of him from outside and inside the Capitol building. 
Brews accused of disorderly conduct and obstruction of Congress, among other counts. Investigators say he was caught on camera at one point grabbing a police barricade and trying to pull it away from officers. The court documents also include photos of him going into his Senate gallery. Every adult in Washington will be eligible for the COVID vaccine in just two weeks. Governor Jay Inslee made that announcement today that the state would be moving up the timeline, making everyone over 16 eligible starting April 15th. Uh, we are confident we can take this step because of our dosage allocations have increased. Uh, we've hit now had roughly 3.3 million doses that have been administered in our state. And uh, uh, more than 1 million Washingtonians are already fully vaccinated, so that's great news. People we talked to on Vancouver's waterfront tonight were mostly excited about it, though some were not planning to get the shot. I'm excited for it. The more, the merrier. I, I don't see a downside to that. I, I think either. that's a, I think it's just fine thing. So maybe the lines are longer, but um, but you still get but it. At least it's there for those that want it. Yeah. And today, two million more Washingtonians became eligible for the shot, including restaurant, construction, and manufacturing workers, anyone 60 and older, those with two or more underlying conditions, and people living in congregate settings. Oregon announced today 20 counties are moving ahead with the next eligible group starting immediately. The counties you see here in blue on the map are opening up eligibility to group seven right now. The rest of Oregon moves on to that group on Monday, and that group includes frontline workers and people 16 to 44 with underlying conditions. Tonight, Portland City Council voted to extend the city's housing emergency, which has been in place since 2015. With no end in sight, the city wants to make some temporary means of addressing the homeless crisis permanent. Now, one key proposal is off the table. Portland parks will not be used for organized homeless camps. Catherine Cook reports. Outside of an emergency declaration, outdoor shelters would not be allowed in parks. That was one of the proposed amendments Portland City Council heard Wednesday. It's part of a series of amendments to proposed code changes meant to address Portland's homeless crisis. It's called the Sheltered Housing Continuum Proposal. Over the last several weeks, Council has heard a lot of public testimony on the effort. The majority centered on a proposal that would allow nonprofits and agencies to set up temporary organized camps, similar to the Kenton Women's Shelter, in open space zones. That includes Portland Parks. We need to set some sort of standards. This is completely out of control. I beg you, please clean up the camps. Put yourself in the shoes of a houseless neighbor. What would it mean to you to have a safe place to sleep, secure your belongings, a place with access to hygiene and cooking facilities, and a place where you can make and find community and support? Council considered all testimony before voting unanimously to take parks and open spaces off the table. This was not the preferred option nor um, intention, and rather um, our focus should be on permanency solutions. Um, and we need to look at available city owned land for these potentially permanent sites. Aye. And I hope that this amendment provides a reassurance to concerned community members. I vote aye. I agree with my colleagues that natural and environmentally sensitive areas are not appropriate for this purpose. Council did not get through all the proposed amendments today. They'll pick it up again April 14th. That's when they'll consider allowing shelters on institutional sites like churches. Catherine Cook, KGW News. There is breaking news tonight of a shooting inside an office building in Southern California. Four people have been killed, including a child. A fifth person is hurt. Police shot and wounded the suspect. This is in Orange, California, southeast of L.A. There is no word yet on a motive. We saw another violent night in Portland overnight. Three people died in separate incidents, and police say they can't keep up. A late night shooting in northeast Portland, followed by a police chase and hours of negotiation, ended in a suspect taking his own life early this morning. The shooting victim is recovering at a hospital. Also early this morning, someone shot and killed a man at a convenience store in the Kenton neighborhood. And around midnight in southwest Portland, police say a man was stabbed to death. If police find the stabbing and shooting deaths were homicides, that brings the total to 25 in Portland this year alone. 
At this time last year, there were two. And so these homicide detectives are essentially buried under their cases. Um, they just keep coming. Um, uh, it was very rare for us to have two in a week, much less two in a night in the city of Portland. Uh, it's part of the circumstances that we're uh, kind of living in right now, unfortunately. Other major cities are seeing similar trends, in part caused by hardships during the pandemic. Look at all these people gathering. It's because this place was loved, the school was loved, the museum was loved. And children have already had a tough year. This is only compounding it. Parents and students rallied outside the Portland Children's Museum and Opal School tonight. The museum board announced last week both the museum and school would be closing for good. That has families who went to the charter school scrambling for other placements. One mom says she'll really miss how the museum went above and beyond for children with special needs. Uh, my son and I have been coming to the museum for years. Um, it is pretty much, we feel, one of the only organizations in the Portland metro area that's completely inclusive and welcomes children of all abilities. Parents say the closure came out of the blue and they feel the board didn't do enough to try to save the museum and school. In a previous statement, the board said COVID shutdowns were devastating for attendance and revenue and they couldn't afford to reopen.